afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, president of City Club, and I'd like to welcome you all, those of you here with us today at the Governor Hotel, those of you listening to us on OPB and KBPS radio or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on April 1st for this week's Friday Forum. We'll get started with our program in just a minute, but first a few announcements. Uh, first off, will everybody make sure that their cell phones are silenced? On April 5th, City Club's Agra Committee hosts a panel that will discuss what each of us can do to assure excellence and equity for all students. Panelists will include two high school students, two teachers, a principal, and a member of Governor Kitzhaber's education team. We encourage you all to attend, and you can learn more about this event on the City Club website, pdxcityclub.org. Immediately preceding um, our next Friday forum on April 8th, next Friday, at 11.45 a.m., City Club members will have the opportunity to debate and vote on our recently released research report, which was entitled, Improving the Delivery of Mental Health Services in Multnomah County which many of you should have received via email already. As you may know, the policy recommendations contained in City Club research reports only become official, the official position of the club, if approved by our membership. Doors will open early next Friday, and we encourage all our members to participate and vote. You can find copies of the report at the back of the room. Also, City Club's two-month membership drive has begun, and we encourage the non-members in our audience today to join City Club and make a difference in our community. Now through the end of April, City Club will waive the $25 new member fee, and new members will receive a coupon for a complimentary lunch at a future Friday forum. Current members who refer a new member will also receive a complimentary lunch coupon. There are membership forums on each table and at the registration desk, and City Club staff is available to help you become a member right here at today's forum. There's no better time to join. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and I'd also like to offer our appreciation to the Friday Forum corporate sponsors whose generous financial support make these forums possible. Please join me in offering our sincere appreciation to our new spring sponsors, communications firm Morell Inc., utility company Northwest Natural, and the law firms of Perkins Coie and Schwabe Williamson and Wyatt. We thank you very much for your support. If your company or firm would like to join them in being a sponsor of City Club, you can contact staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. And now to today's program. The recent triple disaster in Japan, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown, shocked and horrified the world. It also left Japan's neighbors along the ring of fire wondering, could what happened in Japan happen here? And are we prepared if it does? Today we welcome three experts from Oregon State University who will discuss the catastrophic events in Japan and describe what might happen were similar disasters to take place here in Oregon. Our first speaker today is marine geologist Chris Goldfinger. Chris is a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University's College of Oceanic and Atmospheric Sciences. His research interests are, are varied. They include subduction earthquakes, seafloor imaging, mapping, and visualization techniques, and seafloor drilling technology. Along with other research areas, Chris is currently investigating the earthquake potential of the Cascadia subduction zone, a topic that undoubtedly interests us all. In 2009, he received numerous awards, including the NOAA Fisheries Service Team Member of the Year Award. Our second speaker today will be structural engineer Chris Higgins. Chris has been at Oregon State since 2000, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses and conducts research in structural earthquake and bridge engineering. His research expertise is in experimental mechanics, and he has extensive experience testing and evaluating structures subjected to a wide range of conditions, including seismic, wind, and ocean waves. 
He was named an EERI FEMA Graduate Fellow in Earthquake Hazard Reduction. And our third speaker today is health physicist Catherine Higley. Catherine is a professor and head of the Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiation Health Physics in the College of Engineering at Oregon State. Her fields of interest include the environmental transport and fate of radioactive contaminants, radiation dose assessment, and nuclear emergency response. She has served on National Council of Radiation Protection and Measurement Subcommittees and on National Academy of Science Committees. So please welcome, help me welcome our first speaker to the podium, Chris Higgins. Excuse me, Chris Goldfinger. Thank you, Sharon. I, I feel sort of obligated to point out that the exits are <laughs> <clears throat> straight back. There's no overwing exits, just straight back. Um, I, I, I have a little bit different perspective on, on earthquakes now, and I, that's sort of why I said that. Uh, I've, I've been studying great earthquakes now for about 25 years, and this is the first one that I ever actually rode through, and I, I expected that if I did ever ride through one, it would be here in, in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, so I was pretty surprised uh, quarter to three in the afternoon in, uh, we were in, uh, a group of us were in a meeting in uh, Kashiwa Ch and Chiba Prefecture, sort of northeast uh, outskirts of Tokyo, and the meeting was on the uh, Sumatran subduction zone. Uh, we seem to have had a spate of great earthquakes in the past few years, and there's, we've had so many of them, and we can't, those of us who worked on this can't really seem to keep up. And so we're working on the one five years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and about quarter to three, one of our Indonesian colleagues was standing there talking about the discovery of an interesting new seamount that had resulted from, uh, you know, working on the the uh, Sumatran earthquake, uh, when the ground started to shake in our, in our room. And we, uh, we felt the P wave go through. It's sort of the fast outrunner wave of the, of the earthquake. And, we, and it feels like kind of a jackhammering under your feet. And we felt that go through. And we immediately knew what it was. And we started timing it. And uh, <clears throat> so it's like they used to, I, I was on a Southwest Airlines flight once where their patter was, uh, you know, when you get done screaming, pull the oxygen mask down and put it over your face. And then, <clears throat> so here's a room full of seismologists and instead of, instead of running and screaming, we went like this. <laughs> and, uh, and so it took about 40 seconds for the S wave uh, to arrive. So we knew it wasn't right under us. We knew it had to be a little bit uh, further away because the S waves travel a little slower. And then it started to shake quite a, quite a lot. And probably after about a minute of shaking, we knew that this was a really big earthquake. And then we had actually quite a bit of time to talk about whether we should stay where we were or go outside. And um, this is not normal if you're right in the center, center of a great earthquake, you usually are gonna wind up on the floor. Uh, but, uh, but that didn't happen. The building uh, shook quite a bit. But we were also probably in the safest, safest building in Japan. It was just, it was one year old and it was on base isolators, so the whole building was kind of on rollers. And, uh, and it had stout pillars in each corner, about a meter and a half square. So we, we all kind of quickly looked around the room and sized it up, and we saw the little kind of flimsy plastic desks, and we thought that getting under those was <clears throat> completely, uh, you know, it was not going to help us. And then we looked at the pillars and realized we were probably OK. But we decided to go outside anyway. We ran down the stairs. And then we rode through five more minutes of earthquake, uh, standing in the plaza out in front of the uh, University of Tokyo, and just kind of observing everything that was going on. It, it wasn't shaking so hard that we were on the ground or had to grab onto a tree or anything, um, but the, the flagpole on top of the building was whipping through about 60 degrees, and it was a big stout aluminum flagpole, and uh, the trees were shaking. And we went up to the corner of the building and actually saw the whole building going back and forth kind of digging a trench in the dirt as it, uh, the gardeners had put the dirt right up to it. And, uh, and we were just kind of stunned at all the things that were going on. And, but, but also being scientists, we were kind of observing everything because none of us had ever actually experienced anything like that. We study earthquakes as little wiggles on pieces of paper and other things like that. And uh, so, but then it, it sort of, it, it dawned on us pretty quickly that people were probably dying at that moment because it was a five minute earthquake. There had to be a, 
Uh, it had to be huge, and it had to be uh, someplace where there would be a big tsunami as well. And so uh, Harada-san, one of our hosts there, had a, was streaming the NHK video on his cell phone, and we actually watched the tsunami uh, come ashore in a, in a one-inch square screen um, while the ground was still shaking. And um, <clears throat> we all gathered around the cell phone and looked at it and, and, and said, oh my god, there's actually, we could actually see a ship going over the breakwater uh, somewhere. We didn't know where it was at the time. So I guess uh, we all have a, a very different perspective now on, on what these things are, are really like. And we were just, we were not in the middle of it. We were just on the far fringe of it. And uh, we're, we're suitable, suitably impressed at, at the power of it. And, and we could actually, as the waves passed through, we could actually, since we, we, we knew what they were, we knew that it was the Pacific plate diving underneath uh, Japan, but you could actually kind of feel the plates grinding in a, in a very visceral way. And uh, so that group of us at that meeting, I think, will always share that experience and uh, might help us in, in some way. But personally, we knew uh, that it was a huge tragedy for Japan. So we, we've all seen, all seen the imagery and all are, are well aware of you know, what, what's happened in Japan. And, and probably people's reactions to that are, are, are different. You know, we, all, we all, I think, have an awareness that Japan has, is probably uh, two or three decades ahead of us in terms of preparedness. Uh, they're the best in the world. And they have a very long history, a 1,200 year written history of great earthquakes. So this is not a new thing for them. And they've been preparing for this one for, for many, many years. Um, the last great earthquake they had uh, in, in uh, the historical record was 1896. But then they had another one in 1933 that wasn't that much smaller than that. So they have a, you know, a, a, an oral history and a, and, a, and a history as a nation of being prepared for these sorts of things. And yet, virtually every system that they had uh, in Japan was overwhelmed by this earthquake. And so why did that happen? A question you know, that... Uh, that I'm interested in, and I, I don't, I don't work on the, the buildings or the nuclear issues. I just work on the source earthquake, pretty much. And <clears throat> to to prepare for something, you have to prepare for the right thing. And so we're at the very beginning of that stream, where if you don't get the earthquake quite quite right, um, other things will probably go wrong downstream. And and Japan, and and in fact, the whole earth science community got the northern Japan trench wrong. And um, <clears throat> it's not clear why that happened, but uh, plate tectonics, the study of this sort of thing in general, is only, f is only about 40 or 50 years old. So uh, uh, it's a very young field, and we, uh, we're all, I would say, thoroughly humbled by this earthquake, and, uh, and, by, and for that matter, for the, uh, by the Sumatra earthquake before it. Uh, so we have a long, long way to go in understanding which, which subduction zones can produce super earthquakes, of the magnitude nine variety and which ones can't. And now I think most of us are thinking at this point, we really don't know which ones can and can't. Um, two or three years ago, we thought we did, uh, but now it's pretty clear that we don't. And the Japan Trench was, uh, was one subduction zone that, that belonged to a group that for a variety of reasons was thought to be incapable of generating these magnitude nine earthquakes. And, and part, partly the reason we thought not uh, was, I'd, I'd say there was a fair amount of hubris involved. We, we thought we knew what was going on. We thought we knew how these systems worked. Um, we thought that subduction zones with a very old subducting plate couldn't generate great earthquakes. And Japan Trench has a 130 million year old subducting plate. So in, in some way, Japan and the rest of the geoscience community wrote off that subduction zone as a, as a source of magnitude nine earthquakes. And instead they focused on Nankai, the other subduction zone they have just south of Tokyo, uh, which was known to generate at least 8.5s or 8.6s. The Japan Trench was thought to be maybe 8.2 would be their maximum uh, considered earthquake. And so because that's what they had in their history and because the whole earth science community uh, sort of made that call tacitly, all the planning that was done downstream of that was done for that size earthquake. And that's why, all the, that's why everything was overwhelmed uh, in Japan. So the tsunami walls were too short. Um, the, the generators for the reactor, which were behind the tsunami wall, were thought to be perfectly safe, and so forth. And so it was just a cascading series of failures that resulted from uh, just getting the geology wrong up, up front, 
not no fault of the Japanese, the whole the whole Earth science community on on our on our world got that one wrong. And uh, so we uh, we're we you know been humbled quite a bit, and we have we have to go back in in many ways to square one and just assume that any any great subduction zone fault like that should probably be uh, uh, considered guilty until proven innocent at this point. So in Cascadia, we have uh, the, uh, the twin subduction zone to, uh, uh, to well, either, either, either Nankai or the, or the Japan Trench uh, area of Tohoku. Um, the question for us isn't, uh, isn't, isn't if, it's, it's, that's pretty much a certainty now, and we, we know quite a bit more about our subduction zone than the Japanese knew about that one at the time. So we're a step ahead in that sense. And it's, it's just, it's definitely not a question of, of if. Uh, it's just a matter of, it's just a matter of what the timing is, is going to be. And, and actually, do we have enough time to do anything about it? Uh, it could happen today. And I, I tend to think about things like exits from buildings. Um, Personally, I tend to get a little bit nervous at the coast if I'm not near a hill somewhere. Uh, just probably because I just study this all the time. But um, but sooner or later it will happen, and it could just as well be sooner. Um, so I can just describe to you just a, a little bit about what what we do know. Uh, the subduction zone that we have here is called Cascadia, um, as uh, as Sharon mentioned. And right now the Juan de Fuca plate is about. Uh, 50 kilometers beneath our feet. It's, uh, it's about 20, 22 miles or something like that. Seems like a long way away. Uh, but at the coast, from anywhere along the coast, uh, the, that subducting plate is, about, uh, is only about 10 kilometers beneath your feet. And being anywhere along the coast here is just like being in, in Tokai or, Sen or Sendai or any of the towns that we've seen uh, in the last couple of weeks in all that video. So. Um, Fortunately, though, even though we don't have a, as long a historical record as Japan does, we have a paleoseismic record, it, that is, the geologic record of past earthquakes. It's actually much longer than theirs. In fact, it's longer than any, any record of any fault in the world. So we have a 10,000 year record, and we have a pretty good idea of, of the great earthquakes that happened in that time. And uh, the methods that we use can't pick up the small ones, um, but that's okay. We don't worry that much about the small ones worry mostly about the big ones. And so we have a 10,000 year record that has 41 earthquakes in it. Um, and it's at least three times as long as any record in the world. So at least it's, it's not very likely that we're going to get caught out planning for the wrong earthquake. Um, so in, in 10,000 years, we have uh, 19 earthquakes that are probably similar to, uh, to the Japanese earthquake. In, in the, we don't know their magnitudes very well. We do know that uh, the last one was probably magnitude 9, much like the Tohoku earthquake. And we know an amazing number of things about it. We know that it occurred on January 26th in the year 1700, about 9 o'clock at night. Well, how, do, how in the world would we know that? We had, there were no written records at that time. Um, the story is, is quite a, it's, it's too long for today, but it's quite a, a sort of Columbo sleuthing story. Um, and it really, it really comes from, the date and the time of the day really comes from the arrival of an orphan tsunami in Japan. And the Jap Japanese were used to having uh, a pair of earthquake and tsunami come together. And on that day, uh, the Japanese had a tsunami arrive and did damage all along their coast, uh, but no earthquake to go with it. And everybody took note of that in their records. And they also carefully measured the height of the wave, uh, basically for insurance purposes. They, they needed the shogun to pay them back for the rice bales that were damaged in the warehouses, and they needed to know how much to ask for. And maybe like most of us, they might have fudged just a teeny bit, but <laughs> um, <clears throat> maybe rounded up just a little bit. Uh, but anyway, we, we know that, uh, that that earthquake arrived at that time, and we're able to back project the, uh, the origin time so that we know that it happened at night and on that January night, about 9 o'clock. And incredibly, that story actually matches up with Native American legends that said that, that, that they knew about that earthquake and they knew that they didn't have a calendar date that may, would make sense to us. Um, but their, re their legends said that that earthquake happened on a winter night. And so that part of it matched up quite well. So we have, uh, we have scientific evidence, we have historical evidence from both 
sides of the Pacific that tell us about that earthquake. And then going back further in time, we know that we've had earthquakes like that on average about every 500 years, going back as far back as we can go, which is 10,000 years at this point. Um, but it varies a lot. We've had uh, earthquakes as close as uh, 180 years apart and as far apart as 1,000 years. And so, well, that sort of adds a, an element of randomness to it. We don't really know uh, which is going to be next, the 200-year interval. Well, we know it's not going to be 200 years because it's been 310 since the last one. Um, but we don't really know yet how, how to deal with that sort of randomness. Um, we do also know that we've had other earthquakes that were about, uh, also about 250 years apart that seem to fit in between the bigger ones. Uh, they seem to be isolated to, from about uh, uh, the Columbia River southward, so southern part of Cascadia, not in Washington or, Cas or Canada. Um, we have some ideas about why that is, but uh, uh, that's you know area of future research. And so that brings the recurrence time, though, down for, for any earthquake in Cascadia to about 250 years. Um, and it's been 310 since the last one. So, um, so there we are. The, the probabilities say we have a 37% chance in the next 50 years of having either one of those kind of earthquakes. And uh, so <clears throat> in, in terms of knowing what's coming, we know a lot more um, than was known a few weeks ago in Japan. And so it's up to, uh, it, it's up to others to take that information, hopefully, and do something, uh, to do something with it. So, OK, thank you. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, I'm Chris Higgins. Uh, my field is I was introduced to structural engineering and um, I'm hoping to give you a little bit of insight about what we have learned in terms of what happens once the ground has uh, started to shake and give you an idea of what might happen in terms of uh, how our structures and our infrastructure might perform here uh, when we do have that uh, great Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Um, so obviously this is a three-part disaster in Japan. We have the earthquake, we have the tsunami, and we have this uh, nuclear disaster. To give you some background, um, my PhD advisor is Japanese, and um, is, I was studying my PhD at Lehigh University, uh, and he subsequently went back and is now at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, and uh, so some of the information I have is from him, and I've worked in the labs in Japan. I've actually sent graduate students to work in the labs in Japan, and um, the Japanese really understand what their risks are, and they have worked uh, extremely hard to try to mitigate those risks. Uh, they have some of the most uh, advanced building codes in the world, and it's not just the building codes, but they've got excellent materials and they have excellent construction practices. Uh, when you combine all of those things, you would expect to have um, pretty good performance, even uh, under such a large uh, magnitude type of event. Um, and I think based on the information that we are getting, and I should uh, probably give you a little bit of information, we don't have that much information as far as what the performance is in a detailed sense because we haven't had teams on the ground. Even the Japanese have been somewhat limited in being able to get access to some of the disaster areas so that we can really uh, quantify uh, what the overall performance is across all of these multiple uh, infrastructure systems that we rely on, and those are things like gas lines and water lines and sewer treatment plants, uh, railway um, ports and harbors, and then structures, of course, and other um, types of systems. So we don't have a lot of information yet, but based on what we, uh, little information we have gotten, uh, we ex we've seen mostly the usual suspects in terms of uh, poor performance, um, meaning older structures, but m modern design structures have uh, held up uh, fairly well uh, in regard to the earthquake response. And we would expect that um, with the amount of uh, uh, the, the type of system that they've got in place to try to um, get that high performance out of their systems. Uh, probably the most unusual outcome is the effects of the tsunami. I think it was larger than uh, what people would have anticipated. And when you look at the, the photographs of, of the uh, damage and destruction that, that's taken place there, um, you recognize that most of those uh, timber frame structures that are at relatively low-lying areas uh, don't hold up very well and, and become more debris and, and a, a cause for more damage than anything else. Um, the other issue is I think the height of the structures that need to be there to be able to provide people with safe 
uh, evacuation has um, probably needs to be raised from what they would have anticipated before. It, it looks like you needed almost a, a four or five story engineered uh, either reinforced concrete or structural steel building in order to get up high enough so that you uh, wouldn't be affected by the, the, the water level. And I think that's probably the most um, dramatic uh, finding from this one. Um, then, you know, the, the next thing comes uh, when people ask, well, what will happen here uh, when we have our earthquake? And um, I'll, I'll start with a story. I moved here in 2000 from Pennsylvania. My research was in uh, the area of how do you protect structures against earthquakes using high performance energy dissipating devices. Um, and I bought my first house and it's an older 1940s house. And I, um, it, it didn't have gas and we wanted to upgrade the heater. So we, we uh, called the gas company and we said, we, we live on a little cul-de-sac and the gas stopped at the street over uh, two houses down. And we asked if they would put gas in and they said, well, you know, that's, it's probably not worth us to run a line just for you. And I said, well, you do realize I have a 1940s house with no insulation in the walls. And they said, we'll be there this afternoon. Well, it's, so once they, they decided they were gonna put this gas line in, I asked, well, would you install a Northridge valve? And I'll ask a question, how many of you know what a Northridge valve is? So there's, I don't know, I'll, I'll give you 10 hands out of uh, the numbers of people who are here, which is maybe, uh, I'm guessing 5%, that's being generous. So a Northridge valve is a valve that is actuated during an earthquake, it shuts off the gas and it's outside of your house so that when the earthquake happens and your house shifts off its foundations, because more than likely you're living in a house that's not tied down to the foundation, so when the ground shakes your house will slide off of its foundation, your gas lines will likely rupture, your water lines probably will rupture as well, your sewer lines will probably rupture as well, but the gas line will flow uncontrolled um, and there's probably some ignition source in your house and your house will burn down. I'm sometimes known as, I'm known as Dr. Doom. <laughs> so I, I asked to put in a Northridge valve and they uh, looked at me in, in uh, or over the phone at least, there was this kind of this silence and, um, and they said, well, we don't require that. The city doesn't require that. And I said, you don't require a Northridge valve? And they didn't. In fact, there's no municipality in Oregon that requires a Northridge valve. It's a hundred dollar piece of aluminum. It's pretty robust. Uh, it costs you a new construction, almost nothing in terms of the cost of your house, but it can uh, have a very dramatic outcome in terms of saving your house from burning down after an earthquake. So sometimes it's the little things that matter, right? If you go to California, uh, most municipalities will require some type of earthquake shutoff valve. If you go to Washington as well, there are uh, municipalities that require it. We don't in Oregon. And we're really coming late to this party, right? We really didn't have any appreciation for how uh, bad our seismic risk was. And it was one of those magic things when you looked at the map uh, previously, part of the 70s, you know, the earthquake knew not to come to Oregon, right? It, it, I never knew that earthquakes understood geopolitical boundaries, <laughs> but apparently um, who, that's how the maps looked. Uh, and of course, we've some subsequently come to realize that that's not the case, and we actually have a very large hazard that's hitting off our, our coast. Um, and, and in the end, we're really unprepared. Um, and we're unprepared looking forward, one, because it's a different kind of earthquake we're dealing with, and taking the California type of experience, where you have a very shallow, crustal, sprint type earthquake, which is fairly short duration, compared to our type of shaking we're gonna have here, which is an endurance type of earthquake. Right, so if you're gonna run a sprint race or you're gonna run an endurance race, you really need two different kinds of runners. And we, we really need to design for endurance here, not just for sprint. And really, quite frankly, we don't have good engineering solutions to that endurance type of event that we're going to have to suffer through here. And there's a call for research in, try, in trying to address that. And I think one of the things that comes out of Japan is we finally, for the first time, will have some good ground motion records for what these um, endurance type earthquakes are gonna look like. So we should be able to st start to put together the tools to be able to address those things. Um, we have, uh, the other unfortunate thing is that we have not been subjected to moderate or small earthquakes over the time that we have been here. Um, and it, buildings are not uh, uh, unlike animals in terms of an evolutionary process, right? It's the survival of the fittest occurs with buildings as well. If you have a building that's an older type of design, 
um, and you have a moderate earthquake, the weak buildings get shaken out. And they get shaken out over time, right? So that you essentially end up over a long period of time from small or moderate earthquakes with a pretty robust building stock. Well, we don't have that, right? We don't, we've not had this history or experience of having these small or moderate earthquakes that can shake out or hunt down those weak buildings. They're out there. Um, I was sitting having coffee uh, earlier and I looked around and I, I saw uh, unreinforced masonry, unreinforced masonry, unreinforced masonry, unreinforced masonry, unreinforced masonry. And those are the types of buildings that are not going to perform well. Uh, even forget about the subduction zone earthquake, let's just talk uh, you know, a, a moderate type of earthquake. Um, I looked at how many unreinforced masonry buildings you have in here in Portland, and I'm not sure the number is known precisely, but there were 34 pages of 55 entries of what were identified as unreinforced masonry buildings in Portland. Um, those are going to have problems. Um, we're going to have lifeline issues, right? Most of the uh, bridges that we have in this state are built prior to uh, when we implemented any type of seismic design provisions. Um, I spent a lot of time working in the early part of this century, uh, 2003, on the, uh, looking at our reinforced concrete bridges. And they were pretty fragile just to carry freight traffic. Um, so if you put a little lateral load on them, they're not going to perform very well. Uh, you know, looking at what the numbers of bridges that we've actually retrofitted, only 10% have been retrofitted to minimum uh, level. Only three of them have been represented to what we would consider a maximum uh, credible or uh, maximum expected type of event. So um, we really are not going to have a transportation network that's going to be able to um, allow us to recover with any degree of speed. Um, and we're going to be in for the long haul and we're going to have to take some responsibility upon ourselves as well. Most people would expect you to survive for about 48 hours before you can get help. I would expect we're going to have to have a week. How many, how many of you have food and water for a week? A few people. That's actually pretty good. Um, uh, you know, the other, I mean, I think there's some level of what we can do as individuals in, in trying to uh, mitigate the risk. And looking at your house, how well is it tied down to the foundation? Is your, hot, is your water heater tied to the wall? So that's going to be your number one source of water after the, uh, all the pipes uh, run dry. So most of our lifelines aren't going to be very good. We're not going to have much fuel. We're not going to have electricity. Um, we won't have a transportation network. Um, we hope our port will be available to us to be able to bring in um, equipment for uh, recovery. Um, and in the end, really, uh, it's never, just because it's a big problem doesn't mean that we should ignore it, right? Um, if we start today, it doesn't mean the earthquake won't happen tomorrow, we won't be unprepared, but if we can at least start today, come up with some uh, will where we take our local, our state, and our federal resources and try to mitigate this disaster before it happens, we're talking about actually producing positive benefits with that money rather than trying to uh, just scoop it out with a bulldozer at the end. So I think um, I would also say one thing. You know, we, we like to focus on sustainability in terms of um, how we develop infrastructure in the future. And if we don't really take on this seismic hazard, the sustainability piece, and, and marry these two things together, really, because if you have a resilient infrastructure, it's sustainable over the long haul. That's what we're looking for, right? Long-lived structures that can leave a minimum impact on the environment and the world around us. And I think, uh, I think there's a case here for uh, seismic preparedness and retrofitting and new design that fits that sustainability mold. And we need to think about it in those terms as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Higley uh, to talk about some of the nuclear issues. Well, thank you very much. I wanted to spend just a few minutes today and, and talk to you about what has happened in Japan. You've heard about the earthquake and the tsunami. So many of you may have friends and colleagues. I certainly do in Japan. And I know after the, after the incident, we spent a couple of days trying to find out what had happened. People, people largely went dark, and it was a, it was a very terrible time. And I have been very fortunate in that my friends, my colleagues, uh, have managed to survive. And, and so that part is, has been gratifying, but it's also wrenching to understand what they've been going through now, uh, both individuals on the coast and, and people further in in terms of Tokyo and just simply what they're having to live through. So it's one of these things that, that we really need to reflect, not just on the issues of the earthquake, the tsunami, the nuclear crisis, but also the very personal and human crisis that's, that's continuing. 
So a little bit about the, the reactors. Certainly you've heard a lot of this in, in the news, but what happened? A massive earthquake, magnitude nine approximately, considerably stronger than, than uh, was planned for at the time that the earthquake hit. The operating reactors, the ones I'm talking about, the, the Fukushima Daiichi plants are the ones that have had problems, were shut down. That was an automatic process. 15 minutes, uh, they, they shut down, they started their emergency core cooling systems, things were progressing as planned. Shortly thereafter, the tsunami hit and it took out power, it took out uh, parts of their pump systems, some of their backup diesel generators, and they went to backup battery power. And that lasted for a while. And with, if you don't know about power reactors, as opposed to research reactors like we have here in, in Oregon, power reactors, even when they're shut down, have a lot of heat that has to be taken away. And so for a while they were able to remove this heat and then the batteries died, backup power systems died, and the heat continued to increase. And within the reactor core, what happens is that the water gets hotter and hotter and pretty soon you have boiling start and you can potentially, and then in this case what happened is you uncover part of the core. And it was pushing steam down into what are called condensers below the core. The core started to degrade. Reactor fuel is Think of, of uh, metal in a tin can, except it's a zirconium can, and that zirconium can react with steam. It starts to generate hydrogen. The core, the fuel that's in that can can fall to the bottom of the reactor vessel. And what happens is when the cladding, that zirconium is, is uh, breached, is that materials can boil off. And what we had happen was things called the volatiles, the noble gases, started coming out of the fuel it went down into the condenser systems and it was washed uh, intentionally in water in those sub uh, core areas, sub reactor areas. And the benefit of that was that a lot of the radioactive material stayed in the water. And then the pressure continued to rise within the core, within the system, and they had to vent this pressure in order to basically make sure that the containment in the reactor vessel stayed safe. So they wound up ejecting into the air hundreds of feet, meters, hundreds of meters above the plant, radioactive steam. But the containment structures, the reactor vessels managed to contain the bulk of, of the radioactive material. And so this ejection, which occurred sort of sporadically over a series of, of several days, resulted in release of radioactive material into the environment, very elevated levels of radioactivity within the plant and plumes that largely went out to sea to the northwest of the site out 25 nautical miles or more and a few plumes towards the, uh, towards the southwest. Power is now restored at the site. Uh, they're getting cooling water in. Uh, initially during the emergency, they wanted to get water in to cool this system as quickly as they could. So they pulled from any source, they pulled seawater in and they added materials to try and make sure that the reactor stayed shut down, subcritical. Now they're trying to change that water mix because think of adding a lot of a salty solution to a hot boiling pot, you start getting salt crusts, it's corrosive, they need to pull it out, they need to make sure that the pipes don't clog, that they can get coolant to where they need it. So these are the issues that they're struggling with right now. The big Issues for them that have been very, very good is that they've gotten power reestablished. We have, are providing massive quantities of, of water in terms of tanker ships to provide them a, a source of fresh water that they can, they can work on. So now what they're doing is stabilizing the plant and they're taking an assessment of what has happened locally in the, in the environment. So the question that comes up is, well, where does this stuff go? And, and uh, you know, how, how bad is it? And what I want to, to say to you is where it goes depends on what it is and where it's released. You know, that's, that's perhaps not very satisfying, but uh, transport both within the plant and out into the environment is very much a function of, of the chemistry and the system that it's released into. So I mentioned the water. So material boils off of these reactors, gets dumped into water. A lot of things stay in this soupy, nasty mix, and you've probably read in the paper that some of the sumps in the basements and turbine halls had contaminated water, very much, very much so, and that's because a lot of this material was staying right there. 
We also know that when radioactive material is released in these systems, it's sticky. So it'll plate out on many things, the surface of the reactor vessel, the surface of the, uh, of the condenser hulls, the buildings. And once it gets out into the environment, if it's heavy, if it's physically heavy, it falls to the ground. If it's still somewhat light, it will move with the wind, and then the rain can knock it down. So the, the difference between this accident and what happened at Chernobyl was that we had a release into the air, not very high here in Japan. In Chernobyl, you had a core that was burning and very energetic and lofted material very high, and it went globally. Here, you have more like a, a brush fire where things are going up, but not very far, and they distribute to, uh, to not such a long distance. So near the plant, what we have seen is very high levels of radioactive contamination. Um, we right now believe that they're largely attributed to what are called the volatiles, the iodine-131, the cesium-137, and the 134. We also know that there are the potential and, and some releases are occurring from leaks out of the structures into the nearby ocean and into the lagoons. Our expectation is that dilution, although we don't advocate it as a permanent solution, can be very effective in minimizing the impact. So while we can see it very close to the plant, the impact to marine life in the vicinity, uh, which right now is probably uh, nil to non-existent because of the after effects of the tsunami, um, is, is li largely to be insignificant. Within Japan proper, uh, right now they're trying to get out into the fields and determine can they simply plow things under, mix it up, and let the fields rest for a year or so before going back in? That's a decision that's being made as we speak. I've been corresponding with colleagues in Japan and individuals in an obscure field, which is my specialty, called radioecology. Sort of really got going after Chernobyl. What do you do with contaminated vegetation? And, and where did it go? How did it get out into the environment in Japan? As I said, it went with the wind, and the terrain determines what happens to it. Is it a mountainous terrain? Does, it, does the plume smack into the side of a mountain and stick? Does the rainfall knock it out and it land onto the grass? We, know, we understand where it goes and how it, how it moves very well. We will understand much better in the, in the next few days, which is a, sort of the sad thing. The question about us in the Northwest, as I said, the plume wasn't very high, you know, 100 meters or so, and that has a huge bearing on where it goes and we know, you should all know from your, from your uh, school days, the winds travel globally, even, even at near surface, but things mix and disperse. And so, for example, if you have someone in a city next to you that's using a burn barrel in their backyard, you're probably not very concerned because it's not going to make it over to your city because it dilutes and disperses. There's nearly 5,000 miles of, of open ocean, and the winds wander and move, and that air gets washed by rain and by snow, and so it has been diluted and dispersed and it undergoes radioactive decay. And when it finally comes to our shores, we can measure it because we have some of the most sophisticated radiation detection systems on the Earth, and we can detect things many orders of magnitude below any level of threat. So we see it. We see it in some rainwater, we see it in some vegetation, we see it in some milk. But, it's, but it is not a, a hazard, and again, this is an area that I'm very comfortable in terms of, of uh, discussing. So what do we know about radiation exposure, just to quickly put these things in, in context? We know that there is this contamination footprint around the plant site. We know some of the workers uh, received high doses. But just, just for example, one, one of the workers early on was reported to have a 10 rem dose. That's twice a, an annual limit for a worker here in the United States. No adverse uh, health effects are expected, their radiation, their, their cancer risk would go up less than a percent from that level of exposure. And actually, when we look at radiation impacts on humans, using, unfortunately, the atomic bomb survivors as our data set, doses below 10 rem, there's no demonstrable effect. We project below it because we can, but there's no demonstrable effect below the doses that those radiation workers were seeing. So the members of, of the public in Japan, they were evacuated out. They were told to shelter while the plumes went through to minimize their cancer risk. And now what will happen is people will go in with detectors and determine what levels are safe. And again, these are very well-established protocols, international protocols that have been around for many, many, many years. 
and back to what does it mean to Oregon? As I said, it's been diluted, it's been dispersed. The releases to the ocean, if you go out right by the plant, yes, you can measure it, but that's a big body of water and things are going to be diluted considerably. What are the lessons for us here in, in Oregon? Well, we have two research reactors. We have the, the uh, remains of the Trojan nuclear plant. The research reactors are very simple. They are not the high heat power producing facilities that we have uh, in, in power plants. They can lose their water and they'll sit there and, and be just fine. That's, that's how they're designed. They're very robust systems. Trojan uh, has been defueled and it's sitting in dry cask storage and if you had a massive earthquake, maybe you would knock those storage casks over. There's not going to be a release. What about elsewhere along the west coast? The nuclear power plants down in, in far in southern California, um, they have continually assessed their earthquake risk and I'm sure that they will be doing it again and in fact the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has mandated a review across all of its plants to look at can you maintain power, can you maintain uh, cooling systems to reactors for prolonged periods of time. So that's being reassessed at this, at this very minute. And it's an ongoing, it's one of the things that they've learned from the nuclear industry, particularly in the United States, after Three Mile Island, we learned that transparency in terms of discussing problems, so any accident at any nuclear facility is an accident at every nuclear facility. They talk about it. The regulator, the NRC, is not the friend of the nuclear industry, it is a regulator, and they take that job very, very seriously. And they're looking very, very hard at the lessons to be learned from Japan, and that includes issues of, of structure and, and the like. We also, over the years, you know, Chris too, talked about the, uh, the evolution of design of buildings, and if you look at reactor facilities, those designs have evolved over the years, and we're now looking at new passively safe systems, there's some already out there, that can be walked away for several days in the event of a loss of power and it will continue to cool and keep the system safe. Within Oregon we have the, uh, the small modular reactor system known as New Scale, where they have an even safer design and so these are, are being considered as well. So we, we continue to learn from this and, and one of the discussions we always get into is well why, why continue with nuclear at all? And I think it's important that we recognize as, as individuals that no, nothing that we do is without some level of risk. And you need to really accept it, address it, prepare for it, and make an informed choice. And that's really what it comes down to. And working in the nuclear field, I know that we're going to take these lessons to heart. So thank you very much. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host, and our host today is City Club Governor John Branham. John is the Director of Programs for Grant Makers for Education. He previously served as the Director of Development for Portland Public Schools and spent two and a half years in the Peace Corps in South Africa. John? Thank you. Is this on? There we go. Um, so thank you to all of our presenters for the very interesting presentations. Um, my questions are actually twofold. Uh, one, it seems clear that it's not a question of when, or if we're going to have another earthquake, but when. And then secondly, uh, to the last point made, uh, that nuclear power is here to stay, um, particularly given, I think, our uh, country's interest in becoming uh, energy independent from the Middle East. So although none of you are marketing and communications experts, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts about, given these two truths, how might we begin to communicate uh, in, in the ways with the public that will actually resonate? That is to say, people will become more prepared for the next earthquake, and two, that um, you know, sort of the, the adoption of nuclear energy will be something that we're, we take it for granted and will happen, but that people can rest easily at night. I can maybe take the first part of, of that. Uh, so, so education is really the key for us. Uh, warning systems and the like are, are ineffective if you're actually in the subduction zone that goes off. So almost everything that, uh, that the people did right in Japan was due to education. And that's, and that's luckily cheap and effective. Uh, 
solution. So it has to be it has to be just woven into the culture and taught in the schools so that everybody knows what to do in a tsunami. And you're you know that's that's why the death toll in Japan is I mean it's it's very high of course, but it would have been much much higher if people didn't know what to do. So that's the place to start. And once people know that this is not uh, something that some talking heads are making up, that this is real, then that just begins to roll forward into, in, into an inevitable progress uh, in every other field, I think. I, I agree that it has to be woven into the culture. And, and this is one of the issues, again, in the nuclear industry, is you're always looking for lessons learned and changes to your operating practices. And as I said, there's new designs coming out and it, and it comes down to letting people know that, that you always have to address the issue of risks, and there are always choices. There, there's no free lunch. You drive to a meeting, you're accepting a risk. You burn wood in a fireplace, you accept a risk. And, and to think otherwise um, is, is simply sort of putting your head in the sand. We will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership, so you can fill out those membership forms. And before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this question mark card, it means we haven't heard the question yet, and we'd like to. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm David DeMarkey. I'm a City Club member, and I'd like to direct this uh, question to the uh, structural engineer, uh, you mentioned that there were three bridges that have been uh, retrofitted to <laughs> the the higher the higher standards. And uh, in the interest of getting around after the big one, uh, could you tell us which uh, which are those three bridges? Um, I, I could, but then property values would go up around them. In the end, three is just not enough. Um, you know, we have the added challenge here of having some very big rivers that um, can be, uh, depending on when we have an event like this, uh, with weather conditions and, and how high our rivers are running, make it very difficult to cross over those. So three, the, the problem is really not which three it is, it's that three just doesn't cut it. Uh, Kurt Wavering member, um, in the papers and in your statements about uh, the Japanese uh, hazards about uh, radioactivity, I mean, we see pictures of um, spinach crops and uh, milk being dumped and so forth, and you stated, well, we'll have to wait for a year until we uh, can uh, use the agricultural space. Um, uh, but uh, my in the past, what I've heard about is uh, half-lives, not in years, or, or, but more like in thousands of years. And so could you help me understand um, about what isotopes are being released, uh, how much we know at this point, and uh, what kinds of hazards there are if we choose to have nuclear power as a major source of power? Thank you for your question. What we know at this point, and again, it's always subject to revision, is that what I call the volatiles, these are cesiums and iodines, things that boil off at modest temperatures of 1,400 degrees or so, um, were released into the environment and traveled for some distance. And the iodine half-life is on the order of eight days. Cesium is, is about 30 years. When you compare this to Chernobyl, which lobbed hunks of the, of the fuel out into the surrounding environment, you have a mix there of, of much longer-lived uh, radioisotopes. And so right now, what we have seen, as I said, is, is cesium and iodine. We're trying to get additional data. Close into the plant, there will probably be some, some bits of fuel. It really just depends on, on how the actual release occurred. So I, you know, I don't want to minimize the effects. When you talk about, well, it, it's in spinach and milk, it's, it's, it's in everything. Um, spinach just happens to be a good fallout collector, as does the side of a building um, or a road surface or, or the surface of the soil. Uh, but again, there have been really long-standing protocols about how much radioactivity, total radioactivity, we can allow in foods and crops and things. Uh, everything is naturally radioactive, and so you make a decision on how much incremental 
activity can be allowed. And that will be assessed um, over, the, over the next few months to make a determination. And nuclear power and the long-term uh, risks? <laughs> do, you me, do you want to answer or not? Uh, City Club member and field programs manager for the Historic Preservation League of Oregon. My question is for Dr. Doom about those unreinforced masonry buildings that you mentioned. <laughs> I don't know how many people in this room have seen the use that the City of Portland have put on buildings that are unsafe for entry for the fire department in the event of a fire, but there are quite a few buildings now that have the scarlet letter, as we're calling it in the community. You might know for 20 years the preservation world has been talking about tax incentives for seismically retrofitting buildings. I'm kind of curious if you can share with us any examples from other states or nations that have programs for doing the work that couldn't be done 100 or 200 years ago. That's a good question. Um, you know, the part of the thing we have to uh, engage when we're talking about older structures is they are part of this historic you know, fabric of a community and that's, that's something you, you don't just want to bulldoze them because they uh, have additional risk associated with them. The question is what can you do to mitigate that risk and, and historically uh, we don't do that with warehouse type buildings, right? They, they have to be uh, fairly prominent or important structures before you're willing to invest things like base isolation, for example, where you're going to actually lift that building off of its foundations and have it float on the surface so that uh, it's not subjected to the ground motion. Uh, and that's been done for uh, some historic structures uh, in California. Um, but you really can't do that for your average everyday type of, um, of building. Uh, but there are things you can do to harden them to make them survivable. That doesn't mean that they're going to be useful at the end but that you don't um, end up with fatalities due to people being crushed by the falling of debris. And that can be done. Uh, Fran Storrs, I'm a City Club member. Uh, you didn't mention the functioning uh, nuclear power plant in the Hanford site. Uh, would you talk about that and also talk about the threat of an earthquake to the waste, the nuclear waste that is kept there? And additionally, maybe comment on a suggestion that that power plant is considering using an enriched plutonium that evidently was the basis for some of the difficulty in Japan. Maybe tell us what you think about that also. Okay, hopefully I'll remember all of, all of the questions. So the Hanford site, um, just uh, for FYI, I used to work up there uh, for about a decade at, at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So there is the Columbia Generating Station boiling water reactor. They are taking a look, as are all reactors within the United States at issues of, of seismic hazard. Plus, um, since 9-11, they've looked at other hazards that they just politely call external threats. And they don't tell you exactly how they've addressed those, but they have told the NRC. Um, so, so it's something that is, it is definitely being looked at, and they will be very public and transparent in the discussion of what those threats are uh, in terms of, of natural hazards and how they plan to address them. The, the waste at the, uh, the Hanford site, the defense site, um, those largely are in tanks. And if you have an earthquake and the tanks break, well, a number of those tanks have already broken and stuff is kind of in the ground and they're trying to fix it right now. So it's probably not going to get um, much worse than it, than it already is. And I don't mean to be facetious, but it's something that they're working hard to make these in uh, solid, sta uh, safe, uh, waste, they're vitrifying a lot of it. So that's something that's, that's being addressed. And I missed one other question, and I'm sorry. Plutonium. Oh, plutonium, I'm sorry. So again, uh, there is the, the uh, use of what's called MOX fuel, where we are trying to uh, help our colleagues that used to not be our friends um, get rid of a lot of their weapons. And so one of the ways to do that is to consume it in a reactor and to burn it. And all reactor fuel produces uh, fission products. Uh, MOX fuel does have uh, plutonium in it, but most of this material is in an oxide form, and, and plutonium actually, if you're exposed to it, 99.999% um, of it, if you ingest it, you, uh, you poop it out because your body doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't look like any other chemical it's ever experienced. Okay. Uh, I'm Carol Wallace, uh, a member. And I want to get back to the bridges. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I wondered if, you, if any of you are involved with the, the TriMet 
the planning of the new TriMet bridge, which is work will start this summer on that bridge and it's scheduled to be finished in 2014. It has, it's, as you may know, Obama uh, recently uh, added $200 billion to the, his proposed budget for that project. So I would like to know what you know about that and can you get in there and, and, and strengthen that bridge? Um, all right, so first I want to clarify a couple of things. Um, our, our Oregon Department of Transportation um, and the engineering community recognizes the seismic, seismic hazard that we have and that new construction is going to be built to the latest and greatest um, design codes using the best materials that we have available. Um, and, and so we would expect that modern design structures will perform reasonably well like they did in Japan in this recent event. It's the problem we have is what with these older structures because we simply don't have the money available right now to make uh, all of these older structures uh, seismically resilient. Um, and so we have a trade-off of trying to maintain the systems that we have in a, in a, uh, and build out, when we have the opportunity to build out new systems that are gonna be robust, do that. Um, but it's a hard problem to manage and it comes down to how much money it's gonna be able to take and how much commitment's gonna be made to it. The Department of Transportation wants to do it. It comes down to the, the budget to be able to do it. We have run out of time for further questions today, and I'm sorry for all of you who didn't get a chance to ask yours, but you can run up here afterwards and try and catch them and ask them. Join us next week with Speaker Carla Chambers, one of the bright lights in Oregon's sustainable agriculture industry, who will discuss innovative ways for economic development in our region. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation again to today's guests, Chris Goldfinger, Chris Higgins, and Katherine Higley. We're adjourned.